Hi, my name is Amy Freidig, and I'm a program assistant with the Wisconsin Master Gardener Program State Office, which is part of UW Extension. And today I'm here to talk to you about beets. So the thing about beets is you either love them or you hate them. So I want to take a little survey before, we, before I launch in here. I want you to raise your hand if you are a beet lover. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. So uh, yeah, hold on. Is there anybody brave enough here to admit that they are a beet hater? Oh, we got a few, a few. <laughs> now, is there anybody in the middle? A little ambivalence, not quite sure. All right, well, today I hope to convince those in the middle and on the, in the uh, broken heart, black heart over there over to the love side of things. So a little background about me and how I feel about beets. Uh, I, I grew up uh, not being a beet lover. I didn't, you know, I, I knew they were a vegetable. Um, and I grew up with a mom and a grandpa who gardened. So I was around that, but, you know, my mom gardened in the uh, style that I lovingly call benign neglect, as you can kind of see here, but with an example picture of my garden, which is largely untended and left to survival of the fittest. But I never grew up growing beets. And I didn't really become exposed to them until I went to college. I did my undergraduate work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And it was there that I took a class called World Vegetable Crops. And it was there that I was first exposed to all these fascinating aspects of this vegetable, the beet. And I was hooked. So then I went to graduate school for plant breeding and plant genetics at the University of Wisconsin, and there I was lucky enough to work with Dr. Erwin Goldman in his carrot, onion, and beet breeding lab. And in that lab, he and his students worked to improve these vegetable crops that are grown throughout our state. Um, and you're, you're looking at a picture of me here working hard in the lab uh, with a, with a, working on a beet sample for my study. So it was there that I got to work you know, every day with this vegetable and really get to experience it and also to talk to a lot of people about the beet. So that's the neat thing about this vegetable is a lot of people have a story to tell about them, how they love them, how they hate them, uh, how they grow them, how they can't get them to grow, how they eat them. I've even had someone tell me about their grandma's Harvard beet recipe. So. That's the really neat thing about this vegetable, is there's always a story. So today, I'm going to tell you the story of beets. And I know the title said everything you ever wanted to learn or know about beets. And we're not going to get to quite everything. We're going to talk about the topics that I find fascinating. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the domestication, some related plant family members. Uh, we're going to talk about its color and its flavor. And for me, honestly, this is a love story, OK? I really love talking about this vegetable. And today, I want you to leave uh, feeling this new sense of wonder over this, this vegetable. And I know I'm talking to a room full of beet lovers, but I just hope, I hope your heart grows even a little bigger towards this vegetable. So let's start at the beginning, and let's talk about the uh, domestication of beets. So what, what is domestication? I went online, I went to you know, a, a, a dictionary website to get a general definition. And this is, there, you know, when you Google it, you get a, a bunch of them. And this is the definition that's most applicable to us, and I'll read it. Domestication means to adapt a plant so as to be cultivated by and beneficial to human beings. So beets, so beets are a domesticated crop that we have for many years grown and improved upon. So it follows that the beets we grow in our gardens today didn't start out that way. So wild beets originate from the salty shores of the Mediterranean, the Near East, 
and northern Africa, the area, in, that's a world map there, it might be kind of light for you to see, but it's the area inside the red circle. So consequently, because this is where they originated, they have a pretty good salt tolerance. And those beets that originated there didn't look like the you know, swollen red tennis balls that we're used to growing in our gardens. They were a leaf beet, so think more like a Swiss chard or you know, leaves. And those type of leaf beets were actually cultivated by ancient Romans in their gardens. And it actually goes as far back as the ancient Greeks. Aristotle made mention of these um, in, in, in ancient texts and others as well. And these leaf beets were actually being cultivated in other parts of the world even before that. So domestication was going on there, uh, likely with the Romans cultivating these beets, and, which they used as a vegetable crop as well as medicinally. Uh, but we need to discuss how it got from that leafy crop to, you know, towards the more swollen rooted shaped vegetable, more alike, or more, more like the modern beet that we're used to today. You know, and it didn't just magically happen. You know, there, there wasn't reference to, uh, to these swollen rooted types until the 16th century. Um, but somewhere back in history, there's likely ancient plant breeding going on where, you know, these, these beets were selected for characteristics that were desirable, which eventually resulted in selection for these swollen rooted um, vegetables. And some have also suggest, that's a beet, a snow, by the way. Um, <laughs> some have suggested an interesting possibility for another way that this domestication might have happened. So this possibility is this. As humans moved into northern Europe, uh, they, they experienced a shorter growing season and a colder, longer, harsher winter. So, you know, we're coming out of winter here. I can, I'm sure it doesn't take much for you to put yourself <laughs> in that position. What, what are you going to need when you have a longer winter? You're going to need a s food source that stores that you can, eat, you can access throughout the, uh, that cold time. So it's possible that as the beet was tra traveled north with these people, people were selecting for this root crop that had, you know, it was a good solid sugary food source that could store really well um, th throughout the summer. And so they keep selecting and propagating these beets that are, that are big. It's going to keep selecting for those type of characteristics that are going to get it closer and closer to the beets that we're used to today. So I think that's really interesting to think about how, you know, this geographical situation may have influenced what char plant characteristics people selected for. And there's also something that I find really elegant about this possibility, and it has to do with how beets have a biennial life cycle. So if you're not familiar with what a biennial is, I'm going to explain it real quick. A biennial takes two seasons to go from seed to seed. And so with a beet, in the first season, there you go, you're going you're gonna to plant your beet seed. It's going to germinate. It's going to grow. It's going to pr produce leaves. Uh, and then that first season, you know, it'll produce the root. Now, normally, you know, vegetable gardeners are going to stop there. They're going to harvest the root. But uh, depending on where you are, say in a climate l not quite like Wisconsin, a little bit milder, the beet can overwinter outside. And uh, beets need to have an exposure to a certain uh, a, a cold treatment, a certain period of cold they need to un experience in order to uh, flower the following season. So it can overwinter in warmer climates, and then it can kind of come back to life, if you will, the following season. And it uses that, you know, it's got that sugary root. That's what it's using as energy to power flowering. It'll shoot up a flower stalk the following uh, season, and then, you know, flowers, pollen, and produce seed. So two seasons to go from seed to seed. That's what's a biennial. So rewind back in time and think to those earlier humans again that were selecting for those roots that had that stored sugar that they could uh, store and use all winter long. And it was also those characteristics that were beneficial to the table beet for reproduction because that swollen sugary root could also help it 
you know, have a lot of energy to flower well and uh, reproduce to the next generation. So I just kind of find that really elegant. It's like getting two birds with one stone. You know, the, the humans were selecting for things, for characteristics that worked out for, for them, and it also aided the plant in reproduction. So I, re I, I really like that domestication story. And another thing that I really love about beets is that they're not the only child of the beet world. And that's not a slam on only children. I can say that. I am one. So beets have what I like to think of as close brothers and sisters um, in, the, in the plant world. And I want to introduce to you to a few of them. And you may already know them, and you may already be growing them. But let's start out with the table beet. This is star of the show today. And its scientific name is Beta vulgaris subspecies vulgaris garden beet group. And here we have one of its closely related plant family members, Swiss chard. Beta vulgaris subspecies vulgaris leaf beet group is its scientific name. And you'll notice that it's a pretty similar scientific name to the table beet. And that kind of shows to you how closely related these are, these different cultivated beet types. But you know, they've selected for different characteristics. The beet selected for, you know, that's a, a root vegetable. This Swiss chard is we've selected for a large palatable leaf that we can consume as a vegetable. And uh, as a vegetable, it's eaten, you know, you can chop it up, saute it, but it's also found in salad mixes. And it's really beautiful. Um, this is a Swiss chard leaf, and they come in a variety of different colors, this pink or red, uh, yellow, orange. Uh, those can come in blends as well, where the different kinds are blended together in the packet. And it also, this is my, one of my favorites. It also comes with a non-pigmented petiole. This is uh, on the right of that raised bed. That's a Ford hook giant. That's the cultivar. And it produces these like big, beautiful, gl glossy green leaves. And they're grown next to pea plants, so you can see how, how tall they can get. And uh, what I really like about these is that, yes, they're edible, but they also have ornamental value. And you can use them in container gardening as well as borders. And if you're familiar with the thriller, filler, spiller concept of container gardening, they make a great filler. And I think they also can make a really eye-popping thriller. Oops. Next up, uh, a little bit more utilitarian, slightly less beautiful beet, or member of the beet family, uh, mangle or fodder beet. So this, this mangle is growing in the ground here very similarly to a beet. It looks you know, fair, fairly close to it. It's got the same type of shape. It's not going to be that really pretty round tennis ball shape. But a mangle is, uh, is a swarthy big root, full of sugar, stores really well. And it's, because of that, it's ideal for animal feed. And there's another picture of it. You can. You can kind of don't get a really good sense of scale there, but I've grown this and I've pulled them out, you know, especially on edges. They can get to be really big. That's about, I don't know, six or eight inches across. Something really hard you got to yank out of the ground. You can eat this. You can buy this seed. You can grow it in your garden. Um, there's a yellow and I believe a red variety that you can buy online. And you may not want to wait till they get this big if you're going to try to eat them. You might want to harvest them as like a little baby mangle and give it a try. And next up, the next brother or sister we have is the sugar beet. And also not really a looker. Uh, <laughs> this, this beet is an important source of sucrose, or sugar, hence the name. Um, it, it can also reach large sizes, and it's white fleshed on the inside. I, I think the foliage is really pretty, though. It's just really a, a pretty light green I like. Here's pictures of some big piles of it. It's a very important crop here in the United States. It's responsible for 55% of sugar production in the United States. And it's grown in um, acreage throughout, but significant acreage is east of the Mississippi, the far west, and uh, the Great Plains. And like with the mangle, you can also 
try growing this in your own garden for fun. Um, you, can, you can get seed, and I've grown it and eaten it fresh out of the field. Yes, it's sugary and sweet. Uh, also kind of tastes like soap, but <laughs> like with the mango, you might have a different, more pleasant culinary experience if you harvest them when they're, when they're little. So those are the extended cultivated brothers and sisters uh, of the beet, but I also want to talk a little bit about the beet's extended family. So the table beet and its closely related relatives are part of um, a plant family that was called the Chenopodiaceae. And in the late 90s, it started kind of kind of changed and got into the plant family called the Amaranthaceae. So you might, if you're looking around, you might see both, reference to both, um, both families. But I want to show you some that you may not know are related to beet. So we've got spinach. That's in the Amaranthaceae with beet. Amaranth, Celosia, and everybody's favorite weeds, pig's weed and lamb, lamb's quarters in the top right. And so if you're ever weeding and you, you know, when, they're, when they're really small and you think, gosh, those lamb's quarters look an awful lot like my beet seedlings, it's cut, yes, they do look very similar and that's because they are uh, in the, they're related, okay? So one thing that I do want to point out that I also think is kind of cool, because um, I like knowing stories behind, behind plants, is I want to point out the amaranth, that brightly colored pink seed head in the bottom right-hand corner. So amaranth is something we grow around here ornamentally. It can be really striking. And another thing that you might not know is that this crop has an ancient history. It was grown as a grain. It was domesticated in South, and Central America, India, and Southeast Asia. And this plant, you can take the seed heads um, from, from these ancient varieties that they grew, they, they harvested them, they processed them, and then they were used as a nutritious, high-protein grain. So it's another cool example of an ornamental with this cool story behind it that has an edible history. Um, I just get excited when there's, you know, when there's more to a plant than you think. All right. so. I'd feel a little bad if I let you leave today without an anatomy lesson. What is a beet really? What you're seeing on the screen, I'm gonna walk you through kind of a brief botanical look at the beet so you know exactly what you're dealing with this season. So um, the, this, is a, this is a golden beet and it's got a really nice tennis ball shape there and that is a, a, a swollen tap root, that's root tissue. But also that little rat tail like structure going down, that is the tap root too. And that helps anchor the beet to the ground and oftentimes you're gonna see these little fibrous roots coming off from the tap root and that also helps aid the beet in water and nutrient absorption. You can't see the leaves here, they're off screen, but co connecting the leaves to the rest of the beet are the petioles and you can see that here, they're yellow. They're usually, they're, they're brightly pigmented. And another cool botanical and anatomical thing about the beet that I wanna let you know about is the presence of something that's not a terrifically common tissue type, but it's called supernumerary cambia. All right, want, want that one more time? <laughs> supernumerary cambia and what that is is you can see it this beet you know has been sliced through here and you're holding it open like that and you can see the concentric rings there it's this is a kiosia beet or a candy cane beet some people call it it's really obvious here because the different rings are have different pigment um, but what that is um, supernumerary cambia is concentric rings of cambia tissue cambia tissue is a plant tissue type that um, it it's kind of responsible for growth. These cells grow and divide, so that so you know it, as they're growing and dividing, you're adding more cells. It gets bigger. So cambia helps it to grow, and so that's just a unique tissue type. And you can see this when you. It doesn't have to be a candy cane beet. You can cut them all, and you can kind of see this supernumerary cambia that is a distinctive hallmark of the table beet. Now, has anyone? grown their own beet seed in here? Not a couple, okay, cool. Um, if not, you're in for a treat, in my opinion. Um, 
So when you're growing it in your garden for a vegetable, you're only going to get that first season in. You're not going to take it to two seasons uh, to see or to try to <clears throat> grow seed, to try to make seed. Unless, of course, it's a really bad, stressful year, uh, you know, heat, drought. In that instance, you may see a beet flower or send up its flower stalk. And what you're looking at here is a flower stalk on a yellow beet. And um, so you can picture it, the beet in the ground and the flower stalk just goes straight up. This one hasn't, a lot of the flowers haven't opened yet, so it's kind of earlier on. But here's a really up close picture of the beet flower, beet flowers. So think of a lot of our ornamental flowering plants. Those that have, you know, big, bright, bombastic flowers, those plants are investing their energy in producing these really beautiful, bright, colorful advertisements to pollinators. Beets don't invest their energy in that because they're wind pollinated. So they instead invest their energy in making a ton of flowers that can produce a ton of pollen that the wind can carry to another plant. Beets are uh, self-incompatible meaning that if I'm a beet plant and I have a flower on me, the pollen from my flower can't go to another flower on me and pollinate it. It has to go to another person or another, another beet plant's flower. Um, so beet, and the pollen can fly vast distances on the wind. Uh, beet fields need to be isolated by uh, up to a kilometer. That's about two thirds of a mile because the pollen can, can go that far on a breeze and you know, if you're growing beet seed uh, intentionally, you don't want to kind of mismatch your pollen and get a beet plant that you didn't intend to get. Um, and I mentioned that they're self-incompatible, meaning they can't pollinate themselves, and that's in general too. But plant breeders at the University of Wisconsin were actually able, discovered a, a way to make them self-compatible, meaning that a, f a flower on me could pollinate a flower on me, and the result of that was the ability to create um, diff new and different breeding systems for beet that results in uh, hybrid beet, production, beet seed production as well. So when pollination occurs, you get seed. So those, those little balls on there, are, that's, that's a beet, what we call a beet seed. But a beet seed is actually a package deal. So there are anywhere between one and five beet plants contained in one of those quirky looking things. Commonly, you'll see two to three. And so the, the seed is actually a seed ball. And it forms when the flowers, I mean, you could, you could see it a little on that close up picture prior with all those flowers close, close together. As, they, as the pollination occurs and the seeds are set and growing, it'll fuse, fuse down as it dries down and fuse together and then it'll produce that corky substance that you see, see there, that brown substance. So it's multiple plants per seed. And this characteristic, as you see on the screen, is called multi-germ. And so consequently, if you're planting multi-germ seed and you, you plant it in your garden, and what a surprise, you have way more beets than you bargained for, you will need to thin. And you might also be wondering, hey, is there such a thing as a, you know, one seed per round ball I put in the ground? And yes, there, there are. That characteristic is called monogerm. Um, and this is uh, a lot more important, for, especially like in sugar beet, which is heavily, you know, it's an agronomic crop and it's heavily mechanized. So you need that type of precision. So, you know, one plant per seed versus an un, a variable amount. Uh, but there are garden beet cultivars that are monogerm. You just have to look for it. it it'll say it in your seed catalog. Otherwise, a lot of the ones that you're going to um, plant in your garden are going to be multi-germ. So if you're a gardener like me, you buy a packet of seeds, you plop it in, see what happens. But some people uh, prefer to do a more competent job and want to know how to actually grow these beets. So I'm going to give you a couple of tips here. I'm sure a lot of you already know them. So beets like a nice, loamy, uh, light, well-drained soil. And this is especially true during germination um, and if you have clay soils. So what can happen is if you have the surface of the soil uh, get wet 
and then dry, it'll crust over. And the baby beet seeds are going to be, you know, seedlings are going to be knocking on the ceiling trying to get through, and they can't because of that crusting. So you want to try to avoid that. Uh, you can do this by trying to keep the soil, you know, moist throughout, um, but don't overdo it. You don't want to subject the seedlings. You, you don't want to drown them. You don't want damping off. So be reasonable about that, but try to keep it moist to avoid that issue. You can fertilize, but I always recommend doing so according to a soil test and proceeding based on what that says. Um, and I already mentioned the thinning aspect of this. Seedlings will need to be thin because if you're, if you're planting a multi-germ seed um, because you're going to have more than you bargain for. And you want to aim for two, in between, two inches between each plant. So in terms of planting times, beets like cooler temperatures. So you can start uh, thinking of planting your beets as early as a month before the final frost. But I've planted them as late as even early June. Uh, this is a great crop to do multiple plantings of. You can do one earlier in the season and then later to have a fall crop. Uh, you can do this for, if you're going Swiss chard, you can do that as well if you wish. When you harvest stuff that's gone through the heat of the summer, especially if you're eating your beet greens too or your, your Swiss chard leaf crop, those are going to be a little, little less palatable in the heat of the summer and beets that, the beet roots that you um, are going to eat and harvest in the dead of summer might be a little woodier because uh, of, of the temperature. And this seems kind of self-explanatory, but Weeding is important, especially when they're so little. Um, they don't want, need that competition from other plants. They, they don't need to outcompete them for resources. That's not going to help anything. The nice thing about beets, though, is once they start to canopy out, you know, that, those big, beautiful leaves, they're going to be doing your job for you. Uh, they will suppress a, lot of, a fair amount of weed growth with the shade they provide with their big leaves. So hopefully that works out for you, and you get stunning roots like these. But a lot of times uh, that doesn't happen for people. And so the number one thing that people come and talk to me about beets, they'll come and they'll say to me, and I hope this is none of you in here, because I know I've talked to someone today who, who the, we had this exact conversation. They'll say to me, my beets didn't make roots. Why? And so this is the list I run through with them um, of the general culprits that uh, you could try to correct for next year. And sometimes I wonder when they're like, oh, I did it all. I'm like, did you really? Are you sure? So first, water. Uh, did you make sure that they got enough water? You know, when the plant needs water, as a, when imagine that growing beetroot, that, there's a lot of water in there. It needs water to be able to take up to to, to add mass to itself. They need about an inch a week. Um, but, you know, I've, I've grown them in drought years as well and still gotten roots, but water is something to pay attention to. Thinning, did you actually make sure to thin? If, as you can imagine, if there, you've got a really crowded stand, there's not room to, to grow and enlarge. They're gonna be knocking into each other and that's gonna affect how big they get. Fertilizing, this is also a common one. Uh, if you are adding too much nitrogen, you, what you're telling the beet to do is put on big, beautiful vegetative growth. So people will say, oh yeah, I've got these great looking leaves, but no roots. That might be the reason why. So, you know, depending on what you're putting on there and what you're encouraging the beet to do. Are you encouraging it to vegetatively grow? You don't want to necessarily do that uh, too much. Also cultivar, um, and this might be kind of almost experimental for you and anecdotal, um, but there are certain cultivars that I have had very little luck growing um, to produce good roots. One of the ones uh, that's really common and really gorgeous is bull's blood. It produces this really beautiful purple leaf that's really great ornamentally. I mean, it's, it's fantastic, but I've never been able to produce good sized pretty roots. They, I do get roots, but not, not the big ones that I'd hope for, that would be really nice for, for uh, peeling and eating. 
Also, uh, there are some cultivars that are not going to get that tennis ball shape. So there's one, for example, called Cylindra, which is a cylindrical beet. So just make sure you know what you're growing. Um, and if you're having a little trouble with one cultivar, try another one. There are a lot of really great open pollinated cultivars and hybrid cultivars that you can try and see what, what works for you. Soil, we've already talked about, but that's another culprit. If you have a clayey soil, th that might be an issue, especially if early on during germination time, if the soil crusts over. And finally, sunlight. Uh, this also seems kind of obvious, but are you making sure that they're getting full sun, you know, six, six hours or whatever a day? Uh, or are they kind of impartial sun? Because that's what they need in order to, you know, the leaves need that in order to produce that sugar uh, to store in the root. So uh, overall, though, I have found that beets are pretty easy to grow, and most people have some good luck doing it. I mean, even my two-year-old can take, take a handful of seeds and kind of smear them around, and we still end up getting beets. So now that we've talked about how to grow them, I want to talk about the two other things that I love about the story of this vegetable, and that's color and taste. So let's start with the color. So as you know, beets have this vibrant, amazing color. And I don't really feel like a picture, you know, a picture on the screen is going to do that justice. So, you know, take a little trip in your mind now to your kitchen and imagine you're cutting open that beet and that red pigment. And if there's water, you know, a drop of that water with that pigment gets anywhere. It's, it's intense. It's vibrant. There's nothing like it, I think. Um, and what you're looking at here on the screen on the left is some ground up red beet. And is that really vibrant violet red color. And on the right is a ground up yellow beet. And the pigments that are responsible for all that color are called betalin pigments. And the pigment for, that makes the, the red pigment is called beta cyanin. And the pigment that does yellow is beta xanthan. And these plant pigments are st stored in the vacuole of the plant cell. You're looking at an electron micrograph there of a plant cell. And that big white area there is called the vacuole. That's a membrane browned organelle where the, where the plant stores water, toxins, small organic molecules, and pigments. And um, these pigments are found in flowers, fruits, as well as some vegetative tissues. And these, these pigments are found exclusively in one plant order. And remember, order refers to uh, kingdom, phylum, order. I got to think about it. You get what I'm saying. I, I can normally do the acronym in my head, but I'm failing. But you know, all the way down to species. So order is kind of, it's not as broad of a classification. It, you know, classification is how we classify living things, how we put them into organized groups. Kingdom's pretty broad. Species is super, you know, specific. Order's kind of in the middle here. So it contains a fair number of living, living things. Um, but the only plant order that contains these pigments, whoops, is called Caryophyllales. That's how you say that really neat word at the top. It rolls off your tongue pretty well, Caryophyllales. And what's interesting about that is that all other plant pigments, they're kind of ubiquitous across the board. You know, the other, other plants will have, or other orders have all these other plant pigments in common, but this plant order is the only one that contains these vibrant pigments. Why? I don't know. It's a mystery. And here are some common uh, ornamental plants that these pigments are found in. Celosia, four o'clock, moss flower, and bougainvilleas. So also, obviously, in the beet. And these are the pigments in the uh, petioles and midveins of leaf crops like Swiss chard, or the, also in the beet greens, responsible for the pigment there in the petiole and midveins. And you might be thinking, OK, well, if I've got a red beet, I've got the red pigment. And if I've got a yellow beet, I've got the yellow pigment, right? Well, not, not quite true. If you've got the red beet, 
it actually has both pigments. It's got it in a ratio of three parts red to one part yellow, and you don't see the yellow because the vibrant red pigment masks it. Um, but a yellow beet, uh, that has the genetic makeup so, such that it cannot produce the red pigment. It just produces the yellow pigment. <clears throat> and then there's the white beet. Do we have any uh, fans of Blancoma, the white beet in here? Keep your hands down. I don't, oh, we have one. I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slander it now. Um, then there's the white beet, which, which has the genetic makeup such that it does not produce any pigments. Why you would grow such a beet, I don't know. And it's all, this pigment is also found uh, in f as a food colorant. So in the late 70s, interest arose in finding a subs or an alternative to synthetically produced food dyes. So they started looking at table beet. But the issue with that is, you know, you've got this root that's, yes, filled with pigment, but also water and sugar. You've got to, you know, distill that pigment down, get rid of that other stuff. And that takes time, and it costs a lot of money. So it was cost prohibitive, prohibitive to use. So breeding efforts uh, were undertaken at the University of Wisconsin. And what they, over a number of years, and what they were doing was breeding for a, an, a concentrated pigment in the beet. And they were successful, so much so that by, when it was last looked at it to, in 2008, it was only two and a half times more expensive to produce a uh, food dye from these betalin pigments than its synthetic counterpart which is really a success story. And if these pigment or these food, natural food dyes are going to be found uh, in things that are not heated. It breaks down when it's heated. But it's, it's found like everywhere now. I mean, it, you can look in powdered drink mixes, cosmetics, meat products, yogurts, ice creams. I mean, I looked, I was surprised. Uh, I saw it in beet juice used as a uh, food dye in frozen salmon patties the other day, who would have thought? Um, but but they're in, you know, little fish crackers. They're, they're, go to your store, you'll be surprised. The beet is everywhere. So I would argue that people associate beets with this bright red color, um, and that the second thing that people associate with beets is the taste. And a lot of people would disagree with me on that. Um, and a lot of people say that beets taste like dirt. Hence the picture of the uh, fork in the soil there. And they're not that far from the truth. I'm going to tell you why. So beets contain a taste and aroma co compound called geosmin. So geosmin is a volatile compound. And what volatile means is that it's able to go from being in the liquid state, and it likes to go and be in the gas state. It does that very easily, going from being in the liquid to in a gas state. So geosmin is a volatile compound that gives that the beet its characteristic earthy taste and aroma. And the reason that people associate this flavor with soil is because this compound is also found in soil, or more specifically in the microorganisms that are prevalent there. So you may have heard this before, that soil is full of life. If you take a teaspoon of soil, it's amazing. There's uh, about a billion bacteria, four million fungi, and a bunch of other stuff, chock full of life. And so the microorganisms that are in that soil, some of them manufacture geosmin, this compound in them, and then when they die, they release it. And so remember, it's volatile, so it likes to go from being in a liquid state to being in a gas state, you know, so it's coming off and we can smell it. So when you're out there digging in your garden after, you know, nice rains happen a couple days ago, you're turning it over, you've got that really strong, fresh soil smell, while geosmin is one of the main contributors to that aroma. And it's also in beets. So there's been research done to determine if the beet is producing this endogenously by it, on its own, or if it's somehow assimilating it through an association with other microorganisms. And research has supported the idea that beets are able to produce this compound by themselves. But there, there's also the possibility that other microorganisms and their associations uh, may have something to do with this process. But, and there are specific research studies looking at this. But it's also kind of interesting to think about, you know, a carrot, for example, that grows in a very similar way. It grows in the ground, surrounded by soil, no jasmin, no earthy flavor. So why the beet? Why does the beet have this, this earthy compound? 
I don't know. <laughs> and we are super duper sensitive to it. We can detect it at 10 to 20 parts jasmine per trillion parts of water, which is kind of hard to fathom. That's very sensitive. And because of that, uh, it's considered a contaminant. So it's been found in water, cheeses, beans, fishes, and wines. Although with wines, um, with earthier wines, I should say, it's not necessarily considered a contaminant. It's considered part of co contributing to the overall flavor profile. So it's kind of a positive in terms of that. And jasmine isn't a toxicological threat as a contaminant, but it's more of an issue because of the flavor and aroma it imparts. You know, if you're going to your tap and you get some water and it smells like dirt, you're gonna be a little concerned. So that's why it's considered a contaminant. So it also makes sense that when it's in a beet, some people might feel like they're eating dirt and they might really hate that for some reason. Um, but some people really love it and want more of it. So when I was in graduate school, one of the things I looked at was a bunch of different cultivars to see what beets had higher levels of jasmine and what beets had lower levels of jasmine. And besides just being interesting to know, this type of information is, is basic information that you need in order to start breeding for beets with higher or lower levels of this compound. So what I had to do is grow a bunch of different beets in a couple locations over a couple of years, take a bunch of samples and run them through a very fascinating and fancy machine called a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And what that machine does is it measures volatile compounds at very small concentrations. So you can imagine having like a, a glass vial with some ground up beet, like a beet milkshake in the bottom. And the geosmin that's in the, the liquid beet would kind of come up. You know, you, you can't see it, but it's existing in the gas state at the top of the vial. And I could measure those very small levels of that, that that gas, essentially, with this machine. So what I found out was that uh, the beet that I looked at that produced the lowest amount of jasmine was a golden beet called Touchstone Gold. And the two of the beets that generally produced the higher levels of jasmine were uh, bull's blood, which we talked about earlier, and it's in the, that purple foliage on the top of the screen. More bulls, so bull's blood and kiosha the candy cane beet, as well as a uh, sugar beet that I grew. So um, this was interesting. And also, anecdotally, this was interesting because uh, people will come up to you and say, you know, oh, I, the, the yellow beets there, I like them more. They're sweeter. Well, are they necessarily sweeter? Or maybe people reacting to a lower jasmine level. It doesn't taste as earthy. It doesn't taste like dirt. So people think it's sweeter. I don't know, maybe you can identify with that in your, your beet eating. Um, and finding out this information helped me to initiate some breeding populations for higher and lower levels of jasmine. And that work is still being continued today in Dr. Erwin Goldman's uh, carrot, onion, and beet breeding lab. And you're actually seeing a picture on the screen there from a, the, a winter nursery, winter breeding nursery in the greenhouse for breeding beets. And for those of you who really, really don't like that earthy flavor, there is a small sliver of hope. Cooking has been shown to decrease the content of geosmin by up to 66%. So that's like steaming or boiling. Um, but remember, we are very, very sensitive to it. So you still may hate them because they taste like dirt still to you. And for that small subsection of people, hopefully you can get aboard the beat train by eating the greens. So uh, as beets have kind of enjoyed a renaissance over the past number of years, uh, you can definitely find more beet greens and salad mixes, for example. Uh, they're harvested when they're about six to nine centimeters long, So, and you can harvest them off of your own plants and eat them. You can saute them like you do chard, or you can use them in a salad as well. And because of that beautiful pigment in there, they add a really nice splash of color. So I'd like to wrap things up by now, and uh, in a minute we'll take any questions. So today we've talked about some of my favorite topics about the beet. We talked about the domestication, the members of its family. We had a very brief anatomy lesson. Uh, we talked about how to grow it, how, 
how to not grow it, uh, its color, and its earthiness. And today, I hope you're going to be leaving thinking about this vegetable as fascinating, even if you can't stand to eat it. And because I consider this a love story and we're days away from Valentine's Day here, I'm going to end um, with a little love poem dedicated to my favorite vegetable. <laughs> Beets are red and yellow, too. I can't wait to grow them in my garden this year. You'll join me, won't you? <laughs> Thank you very much.